Hey, I'm Ben and I put new videos out like this every week, so if you like what you see here today, please consider hitting that subscribe button. I've owned this bike for the last couple years, put about 5,000 miles on it, and because I'm about to sell it and move on to something else next season, I figured I would do a final review on it. Now, if you guys haven't seen the videos, I've taken this bike through everything from insane single track to 75 miles an hour on the freeway. I feel like I've got a pretty good understanding of what it is like to own this bike long term. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the stuff that I've got done to the Tenere. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff done to it. If you guys are interested in seeing the install and review videos, I've got a whole playlist down in the description you can check out. There are a couple things that I feel like I should mention before we take the bike out because I think they probably are going to affect how this bike is gonna perform in the video today. Probably the most important thing you can do to any bike like this is put a good set of tires on it. So these are the Motaz Adventure Tractionators. Front one is pretty well cuffed and worn. Back one, still looking pretty good. Again, these have about 5,000 miles on them. Definitely highly recommend these tires. Next four things are just gonna be the performance mods that I've got done to the bike. So under the seat here, you can kinda of see the intake that I've got there, which is a much more open intake with a frog skin. On the top of it, underneath there, there is a uni filter, which is washable foam filter. On the leaving side of the engine here, we've got the Camel ADB high exhaust kit, which is just a straight through pipe. And then make sure that I'm getting the most out of all those mods. I did have the ECU reflash by Two Wheel Dyna Works. Again, specific videos on all of that stuff down in the description. Make sure and check those out. There's also links for everything that I've got on the bike down in the description. So let's fire this thing up. We'll hit the road, we'll hit the trail, and I'll tell you what I think of it. So this thing makes about 74 horsepower, it's got 50 foot-pounds of torque, and stock wet, it weighs 450 pounds, but I've got to say, compared to all of the 100 plus horsepower, like 300 pound crotch rockets that I've ridden, this thing has got to be the most fun bike on the road. I mean, how can you beat this? Rolling 20 miles an hour, no clutch. The torque and the power and the sound and honestly just the good feeling you get being on this bike on the pavement and going around the corners it just feels so solid and so good i don't think it's any one thing i think it's just everything this this bike just feels good on the road and like it was meant to be here and honestly i mean i would do 70 miles an hour or a little bit more even on this thing all day and and feel good about it now when you go a little bit faster than that it can kind of get a little twitchy just because of the big 21 inch front wheel the kind of wide handlebars and the big long forks on it there's just going to be some play in there and that's something that you kind of just have to accept when you're going to ride a bike that is as you'll see soon as good as this is off-road on the road now unlike my klrs when you put this thing down a gear and punch it this thing definitely has some go to it Honestly, it doesn't really seem to matter what gear you're in or what you're doing. Really, just cracking the throttle is enough to induce a decent response out of the CP2 engine. I mean, this thing is just amazing all the way through the RPM band. I mean, there really isn't a hot spot. The, the top end is good, the bottom end is good, and the whole mid-range is, is just awesome and, and so much fun. And I think that's why this bike is so much fun compared to, say, my CBR600RRs that were really only fun when you had them wound out to, you know, 12,000 RPM. It's like rain on your Tenere 700 review day. Speaking of the rain, or I guess singing about it, this thing definitely has some very nice wind and rain protection. It's not near as much as the KLR has, but it's still, I think, enough to keep your legs dry in a little bit of downpour. And it's definitely enough to make it worthwhile. I, I think it looks pretty good too, but it gets you a nice clean air pocket. Obviously, the windshield is, is fairly thin, but it's enough that your head more or less is a pretty clean air pocket. I get kind of buffeting right around here, and obviously depending where I sit, I'm 5'10 with 31 inch inseam. And at 55 miles an hour, honestly, I mean, this thing is super comfy, but when you get up to like 70, 75 miles an hour, the buffeting that's coming off of the kind of stood up rally style windscreen is kind of annoying, especially with a helmet with a peak on it like this. Now, as far as the ergonomics go, when you get this bike stock, the handlebars on here, if you're my size, I think are probably gonna give you similar problems to what I had. They had such a, a low amount of sweep to them that you had to kind of crank your wrist like that to grab the bar. And after multiple hours of riding for multiple days in a week, my wrists would hurt on and off of the bike. And that's why I went with this slightly more swept back YZ high bend bar on here from Tusk. Now I've got to say, I'm, I'm definitely glad that I switched the stock seat out for the seat concepts, low seat. 
more so from the standpoint of it's just a lot more comfortable. It's flat, it's wider, it's just a nice place to be. The stock seat definitely got you by. It wasn't as horrible as I think some people say it is. The low seat on here definitely makes it a lot easier for me to get to the ground both on and off road, but only if I sort of shift off to the side of it, being that it's so wide, it, meaning the bike so wide and then, and then you know kind of the seat following suit it's just kind of hard to get your feet down on the ground with a 31 inch inseam height anyway i filled up right before i turned the cameras on and it looks like with my couple practice failed wheelies and my one still uh not very good one we are reaching right around 48.3 miles to the gallon and with a 4.4 gallon tank this thing will if you're if you're not doing wheelies and uh getting around 50 miles to the gallon. Uh, what does that equate to? Somewhere around 200 miles, I believe. Uh, obviously you can't get every last drop out of the tank. But my fuel light usually comes on at about 140 miles and I think I would maybe feel comfortable riding to near 200, depending on how I was riding. Uh, if you ride this thing nice, I think you probably get 55, maybe 60 miles to the gallon if you're really nice to it. To see how this thing does at the Harrison Hills ATV trails here. First, we're gonna turn the ABS off. Now, on the road, the, the dual Brimbos up front definitely do a good job. The rear brake, both on and off road, honestly, is I don't know, not that great. It just seems kind of not soft, but just like it doesn't do a whole lot, I guess. Now, as impressive as this thing is on the road and as much as i love it on the road honestly i think i almost love it even more off-road the ergonomics of it i think play a big part in that uh this is woo, super comfy for me to stand up on i think this is going to be maybe a slow ride with all the wet leaves here <laughs> i didn't plan that all very well did i pretty though the bars are just so high and tall and kind of far away from the seat and the pegs that it's just I don't know, it, ju it just feels good. It's It feels good when you're kind of in the attack position. It feels good if you just kind of need to stand up and rest a little bit, both on or off the road. You can kind of stretch out a little bit. Not that you should ever have your knees and your elbows locked when you're riding, but I mean, you, you can do that if you need to kind of stretch out a little bit. And then of course, when you need to kind of get down in that attack position, woo, it's definitely extremely confidence inspiring. Obviously it's, it's not a dirt bike, but it does a heck of a good job and I was always super impressed with the things that I could make this bike do at my skill level but the the bike kind of in general and the, the height of the handlebars and like I said the width and height of the seat definitely are intimidating and this is not a bike that you want to get on off-road and just sort of put around on it, w it will send you into a tree I, I remember these trees <laughs> Whoa! Oh, ah, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I hope your bike is. It is so easy to get yourself out of, well, into and out of trouble by just kind of leaning the bike, turning the bars, and blipping the gas, and it will just kind of, I guess, auto correct it. Correct isn't the right word, but it is very easy to kind of steer with the throttle and point the bike exactly where you want it to go. But again, with that said, that you know that that's not something that you're gonna want to do for your first time out on a big dual sport motorcycle. That's something that you need to practice and kind of learn. But that is definitely a lot easier to do on this bike than the KLR. The KLR is kind of slow and doggy in the steering compared to this, and unless you're gonna drop the clutch to get the back wheel to spin it's kind of unpredictable when exactly it's going to break loose at slow speeds the klr is just a little bit easier to ride and kind of uh, not as unpredictable and the, the power isn't so snappy it's a little bit easier to maintain control where this bike at slow speeds it doesn't really want to go slow it kind of wants to go fast oh it's slippery out here today the Whoa! Well, there it was. Knocked it. The suspension on here definitely does get some flack from people that I think are pushing this bike to its limits. Um, I, I do have the rear spring preload set for my weight, so I get the correct amount of sag. I got a video on that if you guys want to see it. Uh, I've got the 
compression damping dialed in to uh, well, almost almost as, as hard as it goes both front and back and that maybe makes it a little bit of a jarring ride when you're just kind of cruising but if you're gonna hit the jumps and bring 460 pounds woo, of this bike down on those wheels all at once whoa uh, you're gonna need oh that wasn't good <laughs> you're gonna need that cranked up and honestly it's it's probably worth mentioning that I, I think to really get the most out of this bike I think you would need a different set of shocks with a high and low speed damping uh, just to make it a little bit more comfortable with the slow hits and to make it uh, be able to absorb the really big hits gotta love that power I didn't pop that front tire did I? I don't think so now obviously like I mentioned this is not the lightest bike in the world but I've got to say when you get off of the road and you get into kind of some hairy stuff mud sand anything that I think would kind of make the KLR or any other bigger bike think twice uh, because of the anti-squat rear on this meaning that when you punch the gas the, the rear end actually sort of jacks itself up rather than squatting down and the 27 degree rake of the fork which means how far it's kind of stuck out uh, because of those two things it really makes the bike feel light and extremely capable the rake I think if you kind of picture trying to steer a tire through some deep sand or mud if you are steering directly down on it it's really gonna be grabbing the sand a lot and kind of forcing it all over the trail where if you kind of have that out in front of you and you're kind of more almost leaning the tire around it can't get grabbed as easy and that's maybe something that you almost just have to experience to really understand but oh man uh, <laughs> switching back and forth between this and the KLR on that single track and even like this and my dad's X800 Tiger this thing it just feels so much more responsive and it feels so much more capable and it just feels so much lighter which is odd because I mean this weighs you know more or less the same as both of those bikes that I listed but it just feels so much better and I think maybe the suspension and like I said this anti-squat rear has something to do with that but I don't know there is just something that they did so right I guess a bunch of some things that they did so right with this bike now it might sound like I'm trying to tell you that this bike is perfect it is not and that's kind of where just having the right expectations for it or any other motorcycle is really going to be important to to understand kind of where I'm coming from and you know why I'm saying these things. This doesn't have a, a doohickey issue like the KLR does, but it does have a couple problems that I think are definitely worth mentioning in a video like this. So those couple things are going to be the exhaust. Like I said earlier, this is the Camel ADV high exhaust. The normal pipe would have come down here and had a giant hanger coming off of it. Then we've got the way that the skid plate is attached with these kind of skinny bars that they supposedly say can't even support the weight of the bike. The side case here that sticks out into your boot. I guess maybe I should mention that you actually have to be stopped to turn the ABS off, which is kind of annoying. At least it doesn't have to go through a 10-step menu like Jerry's bike. <laughs> oh, I love this machine. And I'm sure I'll get questions. I do have videos on the GPS that I've got on here. I can put a link for that down in the description as well. So the Camel ADV high exhaust I think is probably the most important thing to put on here. Obviously crash bars just in general are important if you're going to do stuff like this but that stock exhaust I've seen so many pictures of people that have bent their exhaust in and then back out again and then in again and then out again and then eventually that hanger which is welded to the subframe and the subframe is welded to the mainframe and the mainframe is connected to the hip bone I've seen so many images like that and heard so many horror stories that I know you know are not are not going to happen to everybody but even still it, it's just it, it's something that i personally recommend switching out the camel adv exhaust kit is probably the most expensive 
it definitely I think is the best looking uh, they do actually have a, a slightly different version of it now too I'll put links for the uh, in the description for that but you can also do like the the hulls are and I think maybe there's one more too uh, that are maybe a little bit cheaper I mean, it's just a bad design. The, the hanger is too long. There's too much mechanical advantage there. An off-road motorcycle should have the pike, the pipe tight, tight. Well, what's going on with me? The pipe tucked up under the bike tight, where it can't get bent around anytime you lay the bike down. And boy, does it sound good. <laughs> no comparison with the the stock exhaust, that's for sure. And with the ECU reflash on here, I mean, it's been a while since I've ridden it in the stock form, but oh man, this this thing is just a beautiful machine to ride, both in and off the road, with that just immediate power and that nice even power. I just, uh, I love it. It's so good. Oh, I wish that back brake. See, the problem with the back brake is not so much that it's weak, it's that it has to move about four inches before it does anything. So you either have it so high that when you're sitting down, you can't get your toe over it, or you have it in a position where you can get your foot on it, but then you have to press it all the way so it's like hanging down below the foot peg. The next thing, which I don't really think is that big of a deal, the way that they've got the skid plate mounted. Now I've got the, the Camel ADV skid plate on here, which actually has a fifth mounting point woo, on the very far back of the bike, kind of independent of the, the stock mounting system. And uh, that stock mounting system is just those tiny little bars that are sort of just like an afterthought on the frame. And I get it, I mean, they, they jammed a, a sport bike engine into this, so obviously there's gonna be some kind of odd stuff like that, like the few spots in the motor that are, the, the mounting points that are missing bolts. But at the same time, I mean, they, they literally are t telling you that the thing that mounts your, your skid plate that's supposed to protect the motor from, you know, rocks and logs and stuff doesn't have enough structure behind it to support the bike and you're actually supposed to remove the skid plate and put a block of wood underneath the motor and jack it up that way. Now, I think that is just them being extremely overcautious. I've jacked mine up several times. I think I've actually sat on it, whoa, with still the sock skid plate on here. And then again, now that I've got the, the Camel ADV one on here, it gives me a lot more confidence, but I still jack it up just the same. And, I've never had any issues with it. Um, I think if you bash something hard enough, it probably would bend those. Luckily, they are bolted on and replaceable, so I guess as long as you don't really damage your motor, woo, then maybe it's not a big deal, but is uh, definitely something that is a little bit surprising when you get this $10,000 motorcycle in your garage, and actually they're more than that now. But when you get in your garage and have it up on the jack and are reading through your manual and realize that hey, you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> the other thing, honestly, I've all but forgotten about that side case does kind of get in the way of your boot, but I don't know. It's just something that is kind of surprising to begin with. And then again, you kind of just get used to it and then you don't worry about it anymore. Woo. I'm embarrassed now. I feel like I'm not gonna do this bike justice off-road. I guess I've got some other videos of me ripping it a little bit harder, but with all these wet leaves in the mud, I don't <laughs> I don't really wanna put this into a tree. I'm actually already nursing a knee injury. I looped my TW200 on myself on the road when I was practicing wheelies the other day. <laughs> now back when I bought this motorcycle, there was really nothing else out on the market that I would say was a, a direct competitor. There were some KTMs that were kind of close and yeah, the the BMWs are sort of in the neck of the woods of the Tenere, but I mean, this kind of just set a new precedent for mid-weight adventure bikes, and you know, now they're kind of coming out of the woodwork, but honestly, uh, I just, I don't think that if I was gonna own something for a long period of time, I would want it to be anything other than a Japanese bike. They just have such a good track record where bikes like the new Ducati Desert X, the Norton, from Husqvarna and the Aprilia Torig, I just, I don't think that I could buy one of those and be confident that nothing was gonna go wrong with it. They may be superior in both the power and the, the just overall driving experience. They, I'm sure, have much better suspension, but they're just, they're not a Yamaha or a Honda. As far as maintenance on this bike goes, I have to tighten up my 
Come here. <laughs> oh, well, this doesn't look like a bad spot to do that. Look at that. How oh, gorgeous. I guess I could turn my Tusk Grip Eaters down. Got a video on how I installed those on here if you want to see that too. All sorts of good stuff in that playlist. I really have done quite a bit to this bike. And honestly, it's fairly easy to work on. For the majority of riders, you're never going to have to do anything with this other than change the oil and change the air filter, both the drain plug and the the oil filter, which is like, I guess, an externally mounted oil filter, rather than just kind of like the media that gets shoved into the case of the motor, like a lot of dual sports are. Uh, both of those are just stuck off the front of the motor. You do have to pull the skid plate, which, you know, I don't know, is a little bit annoying, but still is definitely very easy to do. One thing that I will say that uh, is maybe a little bit contradictory to what I usually say about the owner's manual, do not follow what it tells you to do for a torque spec in the owner's manual for that drain plug. I have seen so many posts from people saying that they finally used a torque wrench and they pulled the threads out or snapped their plug. I don't know why they decided to put whatever number it is that they put in there, but just do it by feel. If you don't feel like you know what you're doing, then well, take it into your, your dealership or to somebody that does. Uh, air filter, I think you gotta be careful of when you're changing. You don't wanna drop any dirt down into it. It's kind of a, I don't know, not a not an ideal situation, but still fairly easy enough to do. And of course, I would suggest getting a washable foam filter for it. I've got two, so I just swap them in and out and clean them whenever I feel like it. Woo! One thing I guess that I've kind of actually put out of my mind to finally now is you may have, may have heard that little bit of chatter going up the hill, and that's, I think, just the chain clanking around and it's sort of just... Maybe a little bit of a side effect of the, the anti-squat rear, although I, I think my KLR kind of slaps around a little bit too, so it makes a bit of noise and it, it maybe sounds a little bad, but I put so many dirt miles on this, I, I totally trust it now and I just ignore it and know that it's okay. And other than that, man, this bike feels so good on these trails. Could do with a few less giant rocks, but <laughs> other than that, oh, I love it. Honestly, no matter what motorcycle you've got, if it can get you to trails like this and get you around them and put a smile on your face, that's that's the right motorcycle for you. I don't care what it is. And for right now, anyways, the T7 is definitely doing that for me. Although I am trying to convince myself to sell it to my dad so I can try something else next year. But man, I'll, I'll be honest, it's it's going to be a hard bike to get rid of. It's there's just something special about it. It just it just feels so good and so right. Camel ADV skid plate. That is a rough hill. So I think that's all I've got for you guys. If you have any comments or questions, don't be shy. Leave them down below. If you want to see more videos on the T7, again, check those links down in the description. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Other than that, get out and enjoy this beautiful world any chance you get. If you can't do that right now, here's some more videos to check out in the meantime. Take care, stay safe, and stay swanky.